So a very warm welcome to members of the Francis Bacon Research Trust and the Francis Bacon Society, and especially you zooming in so early in the morning from America and Canada. So this is the third of the four talks by Peter Dawkins, and the title is Development of the Rosicrucian Work and the Birth of Shakespeare. And first of all, thank you, Peter and Sarah, for hosting this talk and many, many congratulations on the 40th anniversary of the Trust. Really, really good work, thank you. So today is significant in Baconian history because for the very first time meeting together, we have all three principles of the three Francis Bacon charities. So that is of course, Peter Dawkins, who founded the Francis Bacon Research Trust in 1980. And then all the way from California, thank you, Lawrence. Lawrence Gerald, who in 1997 founded Francis Bacon's New Advancement of Learning, better known to us all as www.sirbacon.org. I'm Susan McElroy, current chair of the Francis Bacon Society, founded in 1886. And I hope you'll all agree uh, Baconians getting together is a very positive move. Now, we, we know that Peter has said that Bacon and the Rosicrucians is his favourite subject, and it's certainly one about which he's very knowledgeable. And in eight, 1989, he published Shakespeare and Fra Christian Rose Cross. One of the sources he mentions is that brilliant writer, William Francis Wigston. And in Wigston's book, Francis Bacon versus Phantom Captain Shakespeare, he rails, how long will fashion, passion and prejudice hold out against the truth? And Peter, we must thank you for holding out for the truth and keeping this subject very much alive. Thank you, Peter. Well, thank you very much, Susan, for that introduction. Uh, that's a very lovely introduction. And um, I certainly hope, like everybody, well, a lot of people hope for, is that truth will eventually come out more and more, which of course is what the whole Bacon Rosicrucian work is about, to help us bring forth the truth. And um, it's done over a period of time, time's known as the great initiator in this. Well, this, this talk tonight is going to be part three of this four-part series about Bacon and the Rosicrucians, and um, I've called it the development of the Rosicrucian work and birth of Shakespeare. And it's, um, it's a very important, exciting phase of the whole story, I think. Um, previously in part one, just to give a quick summary, um, part one, I mentioned the Rosicrucian manifestos of 1614 to 15, which made public the existence of the Rosicrucians and also the Rosicrucian project of the installation of the whole wide world through the renovation of all arts and sciences. Installation means um, a renovation or rebuilding of something and uh, keeping the best of the old, but getting rid of, well, getting rid of the ruins as it were and building up something very, very new and very much better than before. Um, and it comes from the idea of the installation or rebuilding of Solomon's temple. Um, it's talked about in the Bible. So Bacon uses that word quite a lot, certainly for his great installation. He, that's where he got the word from. And the, these manifestos, Rosicrucian manifestos, also refer to a celestial phenomena of 1604, which signaled the opening of what they called Fra CRC's tomb. Later on, it's referred to, like um, John Wilkins uh, in, in his book on mathematics, as meaning Francis Christian Rosecross, which is very interesting. And according to a prophecy by Paracelsus, the 1603 to 4 celestial phenomena also announced the appearance of great being called Elias the artist. I mentioned about Michael Meyer who revealed that the founding of the Society of the Rosy Cross took place in England in 1570, based on a secret society established in London in Henry VIII's time as a branch of the Paris Society of Magi, founded by Agrippa. 
Robert Flood stated that the 1604 celestial phenomena was a sign to the Rosicrucian Brotherhood to emerge from their period of secrecy that had begun in 1572, during which they had prepared their work, and to both expand their membership and begin the restoration of the world. Now, in 1572, a startlingly visible supernova had appeared in Cassiopeia, the heavenly, which is known as the Heavenly Virgin Queen, which was said to be announcing the birth of a great light on earth, born of a virgin queen. It shone bright in the sky until 1574. I also mentioned then that um, John Dee was a key person in the Rosy Cross Society, as well as in Freemasonry, and gave you the reasons why. And in part two, I talked about the establishing of the Rosicrucian work and the education of Francis Bacon, his training, his initiation in the Rosicrucian fraternity, and his vision, his great vision of 1572 to three of the Great Inspiration, or what became the Great Inspiration. And Francis Bacon, I mentioned, was sent to France when he was still a teenager, where he contacted the secret society there in France, um, and then the importance of the French poets like the Pleiades, and the Family of Love, the Palace Academy, and the French Academy. And I showed you the AA signature of the secret society being passed down through the centuries and ages. And also the first AA, the signature was double A, the AA. The first double A headpiece was printed in a private book for Francis Bacon in 1576, soon after he had arrived in Paris. I think that's very significant. Then when Francis Bacon returned to England in 1579, the AA headpiece started being printed in a wide variety of English books. Then in, during, during, the night, during the 1580s, Francis Bacon was in England, involved in law, philosophy, poetry, entertainments, intelligence gathering, and helping Burley and the Queen. Whilst his brother, Anthony Bacon, they're very, they were close friends with each other, but he went abroad in, into France and elsewhere, working as an intelligence and diplomat, but privy to and sharing the same vision and goal as his brother Francis. And then it was in that time, the 1580s, that the English Elizabethan poets began to develop. Uh, the first well-known one was the Areopagus, led by Philip Sidney and patronized by Leicester, and then the University Wits. And then John Dee, who's quite a key player in this, he departed for the continent to Prague in 1583. Now, all that really brings me up now to what I'm gonna talk about now, the development of the Rosicrucian work and the birth of Shakespeare. And the key date in this is 1593, but before that, certain very important things happened, such as, on the 17th of October, 1586, Sir Philip Sidney died. Now he was the great English hero for many reasons. Um, and before he died, he passed on his sword and also his heroic mantle was passed on to Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. This was a major thing, in fact, it doesn't sound much to us today, but in those days, this was a major thing. So Robert Devereux became the the hero of England in, in, in uh, the public eyes. Um, he also became a favorite of the queen. And in June, 1587, the queen made Essex her master of the horse in place of Leicester, who was th then, um, he, he married somebody else and um, he, he was aging and, and not so well. So he had been the master of the horse, but uh, now Essex replaced him and Essex, then definitely became the Queen's favourite more and more, more and more important to her. On the 4th of September, 1588, Leicester died. Now he'd been the great patron of the poets up to that time. And they used to meet in Leicester House on the Strand in London. Well, once Leicester had died, Essex inherited it all and, and he renamed Leicester House the Essex House. And it continued on as the main meeting place of the poets quite an important thing to note. This is in London. And in 1589, John Dee returned to England. And he lived at his house in Mortlake until 1595, but his library whilst he was away had been ransacked 
and he hadn't hadn't any patronage anymore. So he 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 lived in poverty basically, which is, which is very sad because he's such a key important person really. Um, then in 1591, Francis Bacon gave up his rare and unaccustomed suit, as he called it. Now this was a suit with Burley and the Queen, which he initially made on his return from France in 1579, and which he was promised would be fulfilled, but which was always delayed with yet more promises. So the years went by. And in 1591, he find, Francis Bacon finally got fed up with waiting. And one of the reasons for the delay was probably because Lord Burley, who was Bacon's uncle and the Queen's Lord Treasurer and main advisor, despised poets, didn't, didn't like them. He liked academics and so on like that, but he couldn't stand poets. And, um, and Francis's project was for an academy to be set up in England, like the ones he had experienced in France, namely the Royal Academy patronized by Henry III of France and headed by the French poets known as the Pleiades, which embraced philosophy, philology, drama, music and court entertainments. And then what was called the Petite Academy, the small academy, headed by Bernard Palassi, also known as the Potter, who lectured on natural science. So Francis Bacon gave up on, on that and decided, obviously decided to do things himself with the help of friends. So in 1591, Francis Bacon allied himself with Essex. He was by this time completely disillusioned with and thwarted by his uncle Burley. So he decided to assist Robert Devereux in every way possible believing him to be the fittest instrument to do good to the state, that's his own words, but always with the reservation that his first duty was to the Queen. And Essex in turn promised to help Francis. Then in 1592, Anthony Bacon returned to England and then the fun really begins, to my mind anyway. Um, Anthony left Bordeaux in France, where he had been living for a time. He left there in January 1592 and set foot in England on the 4th of February 1592. And there he joined his brother Francis at Gray's Inn, where they had, uh, they had chambers there, which would be made into a house in a very prominent position of, of the old Gray's Inn, um, called the Bacon Chambers, which their father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, had um, set up and bequeathed to them. Now, at the request of Francis, Anthony put himself at the service of the Earl of Essex in respect of running an intelligence service on behalf of Essex, so that Essex could be supplied with good, up-to-date intelligence, so as to advise the Queen and remain, and remain her favourite. So both brothers now served Essex in this intelligence capacity to keep Essex well informed and advised on matters of state. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> and for the next two years until April 1594, Anthony Bacon lived chiefly with his brother Francis, either in the Bacon chambers at Gray's Inn or at Twickenham Park. Francis's house by the Thames opposite Richmond Palace. So whenever he wanted, he could easily take a, a boat over the Thames to Richmond Palace and visit the Queen, because the Queen often liked to see Francis and, and talk with him and be advised by him. Now, 1592 was Francis Bacon's 32nd year. Now, why is this important? Well, besides being Rosicrucians, both Bacon brothers were Kabbalists. They understood the Kabbalistic tree of life and how it related to the laws of the universe and also to the degrees of initiation. So there are 32 paths, as it were, to climb this tree of life. So it's like going up a ladder of initiation. And 32, number 32 signifies the completion of the tree of life paths and degrees of initiation after which one goes beyond into another tree of life, a further one. And this is called going beyond. 
And this is the real meaning of what's called the 33rd degree. It means you've gone beyond, something beyond all those who are still on the first tree of life. Uh, the 33rd degree is going beyond into something even greater and more profound. So during 1592, Francis Nant and his great scheme was made ready for going beyond. They knew, they knew all that timing and time. They, they worked everything out very, very carefully to go with the right timing, because time is the great initiator who brings forth the truth. Now, which was, must have been wonderful for them to see, in Nova, November, December 1592, two new stars, twin novae, appeared in Cassiopeia. And this was obviously to the brothers, the celestial signal and confirmation of their Rosicrucian work, which they had prepared for the, for the off, for the, go, for the go. And it came just at that stunning moment. And you, yeah, okay. And I should be seeing a picture of, of the sky, a fraction of it just to show the sign of Cassiopeia, the constellation of Cassiopeia. Can you all, can you all see that okay? If I'm gonna point out where she is and she's made up of these five stars, which are joined together like, um, depends which way you look at it, but it's either seen as a, a, an M or a W. And Cassiopeia, she's known as the celestial queen, sometimes called the virgin queen. Although, of course, her story and myth is not quite, quite like that. <laughs> but this is what she's known in, in tradition. So she's very important. So when, when the supernova appeared in 1572, it was seen as, a, as the celestial queen, the Virgin Mother, had given birth to a great light on Earth. And, um, and people then searched around for where this light should be. And actually, if you project the star map onto the ground at that time, uh, which some people did, you know, the astronomers at the time did, uh, Cassiopeia fell over the British Isles. So that's when the Rosicrucians took up the idea, our queen is the Virgin Queen. She's acting the, the role of Cassiopeia on Earth. And, um, and of course, those, those in the know, the top Rosicrucians were close to the queen and so on. So they knew that she'd given birth to a child already. And um, so they, they saw that like Paracelsus, his prophecies, they'd also been prophesied that a great being would come. Um, and so that's what the Rosicrucian fraternity was prepared for um, in, this, in these lands, really, that were associated with Cassiopeia, the celestial queen or virgin queen. And the, the signature of her is interesting because the five stars there make up like a W, but the central star is it comes and goes, you know, astronomers look at it and it's an unstable star. It's some, sometimes there, sometimes not. So it makes a sort of gap. So you find that those in the know used to make sure their, their printing came up with a W like two Vs, but one V not the same as the other. Can you, can you see me pointing to it on the screen now? This, this is actually taken from Venus and Adonis. And, um, so here's the one V and it just bends over the top where it should really join the other V to make a full W. Now printers did have Ws, they could make proper Ws, but they deliberately didn't when they were trying to show these ciphers of, of something deeper, a mis mystery to be seen in it. So that's a symbol of, of, of her. Um, now the interesting thing about Truth is truth is always double. So it's known right from ancient Egyptian times, probably earlier, as the double truth. And that, that's why in, in the Hebrew Bible, for instance, in Genesis starts off with God created heaven and earth. Um, in the beginning of the beginning, it's always beginning. God, the name of God is in Hebrew Elohim. And Elohim is a plural word. It's not singular, it's plural. And the Kabbalists know that as standing for Abba Ama, which means father, mother. 
the divine father, mother, father, mother, uh, father, God, mother, goddess, you know, and um, and they became heaven and earth. So you've got the polarity there. They're expressing themselves in that polarity. But everything, everything after that is double. All things are male, female. We, we only manifest in the world because of polarity. We have a top and a bottom, for instance. We didn't have that. We wouldn't be here, wouldn't exist. We have a front and a back, left and a right, inside, outside, and, and so on. And we're all, all souls are male, female. Again, as it says in Genesis, um, we all have male and female char characteristics in us. And um, we can act whichever part we like, uh, what's appropriate, and so on. Um, so gra only gradually are people generally becoming more and more aware of these things. Um, because always in the past, the human tendency has been to think everything is just single, only one God, and that one God is male, and da -da, and you forget about the female side of it. And maybe long, long time ago, it was the other way around. Who, who knows? But, but at last, in these days, um, we're getting to understand everything is actually this, this double truth. And Francis Bacon and the Rosicrucians and the Society of Magi before him, they, they, the top people in those societies, they, they knew this and they were trying all the time to help correct humanity's thinking, to, to bring us around to this more humane understanding and uh, of loving God who is love and loving each other, a double truth again. Love God, the immortal, the divine, the concept, if you like, some people would see it, um, or love the principle of love, which is God. But love each other too. You know, it's it's it, it's it's the du double truth, as above, so below, as as Hermes used to say, as above, so below, as below, so above, for the doing of the great work. Now, in the signature that Rosicrucians used, going right back in time to ancient Egypt, the double A A A was the sound, or, or the the, the um, description, the title given to Toth, which means truth. Truth was the R, ah, spelt as a double A, R. Ah. And they would describe Toth as pa R, ah, pa R, ah, pa R, ah, which means the truth. I'd uh, see the, the great, the great, the great, who is the truth. And then you get Hermes Trismegistus, who's um, the Greek version of Toth, the thrice great. Uh, that is derived from that. So that, that, that sound, the R, also is the basic sound of love. Ah, ah. It's also the sound of, ah, I get it. And ah, revelation. You know, finally, I, I know. So it, it, it's a wonderful sound. And reversed, if you like, the reverse of it, uh, or its opposite polarity, is the double V. So the double A could represent the divine father, son, and the double V the divine mother daughter, which is the sign of Cassiopeia, um, the heavenly mother. And then the A plus the V together, combine them together like two triangles and you get Solomon's seal, which when it becomes perfect, becomes the Christ star or blazing star of the Rosicrucian mysteries, the higher mysteries. And it represents the mystical marriage of lover and beloved, spirit and soul, wisdom and intelligence, etc. And, and it's also used to represent the full knowledge of truth on the tree of life, the unnumbered sephira called knowledge, the knowledge of truth, which Francis Bacon's whole work was to, was to enable us to reach that more easily, to really know the truth. And you only know the truth, which is love, you only know the truth by putting it into action. You've got to do it, the labor of love, um, love in action, and then you will know from experience what, what the real truth is. And that in modern terms is described as illumination, the, the perfect bliss or illumination. Um, an old name for it was peace. So that's why the seventh day is called the, seventh day of creation is called the, the day of peace. It's actually when you're supposed to reach full illumination. Now the two stars, the twin novi that appeared in Cassiopeia obviously represent the twins, the Gemini, born of the heavenly mother. And um, 
And in the myth of the Gemini, the parents of the Gemini are known as Leda and the Swan. Swan being Zeus in disguise and Leda also being a swan. And she hatched swan eggs. And um, so the Gemini were actually swans born of swan eggs. I mean, they're symbolized as swans born of swan eggs. And Castor and Pollux were the names of the two men. There were also two women too. Castor and Pollux are known in Latin as the Gemini, which means twins, or in Greek as the Dioscuri, the sons of Zeus. And Castor is born mortal, but Pollux is born immortal. So you've got the mortal and the immortal idea, the, the, the double truth again, the polarity to each other. In the myth of, of the Gemini, the two brothers had a profound love for each other and became inseparable in their friendship. And when Castle died, which he had to as he's mortal, Pollux then was so sad out of his love, he offered his immortality up in exchange for Castor's resurrection into immortality. And because of the brothers' love for each other, Zeus instead made them both mortal immortals or immortal mortals, which means son of God and son of man. The type, same title is given to Jesus. <coughs> so, so you marry, it's a marriage of those two opposites together into perfection. Uh, here's, i share the next slide. This shows, this is an emblem produced in 1581 by Vincenzo Catari. It's called Images of the Gods of the Ancients. It has this wonderful picture of the Gemini. Um, and it shows them as they're commonly represented as riding white, white horses, dressed in white tunics and purple mantles, wearing egg-shaped egg caps or helmets crowned with flames and holding shining spears vibrating with light. Now their helmets are the original caps of liberty, of freedom. And in respect of this, the twins are known as the Fratre Piliati, as it's Latin for the cap bearing brothers or the helmet bearing brothers. But these helmets or caps represent being free, freedom, and, the, and who can give the gift of freedom to others. From the myth of their origin and the spear symbolism, they're also known as swans and spear shakers, i.e. Shakespeare's. Now, 1593 was Francis Bacon's 33rd year, going beyond, because the 22nd of January was, or 1593 was his 32nd birthday, so the 23rd of January, 1593, he went beyond into his 33rd year, the beginning of the second tree of life. So what was prepared was then launched publicly. So in 1593, William Shakespeare was born to the world. On the 18th of April, 1593, Venus and Adonis was entered into the station as Liber B by Richard Field, a printer from Stratford-upon-Avon. And in June, 1593, Venus and Adonis went on sale. And this, I'm showing you now the title page of Venus and Adonis and the dedication page. This, this, what I'm showing is the title page of 1594 quarto edition, but it's exactly the same as the 1593 one. And so is the dedication page. You can see there the dedication is signed as by William Shakespeare. I mean, it's in print, it's not a real signature. <clears throat> and it's dedicated to Henry Riothsley, who was the Earl of Southampton and a friend of, of Francis and Anthony Bacon. The poem's an Ovidian poem written in what's called Sestra Rima. That's a quatrain followed by a couplet. And basically it's a light-hearted erotic poem, which some people at the time were rather upset at its eroticism. <laughs> well, the story goes that Venus, that's the goddess Venus, was in love with the youth Adonis, who's mortal and detains him from the chase. She pulls him off from his horse and woos him on the ground, but she fails to win his love. 
And she begs him to meet her the next day, but he's already arranged to hunt the boar, which she wants to do. So she tries in vain to dissuade him. So when the next day's morning comes, she hears his hounds at bay. And then filled with anxiety and premonition, she goes to look for him and finds him lying on the ground, killed by the boar. From Adonis's blood sp spilt on the ground sprouts a purple flower checkered with white, which Venus plucks, lifts up and takes to her heart. And there's only a few lines in the poem describe that, but that's a very, very important ending to the poem. Now the flower is known in myth as being scientific name is it's a red flower of the crowfoot family pronounced in latin ranunculacea ranunculacea which ovid in his metamorphosis describes as the anemone the anemone is is is, is, is a species of that crowfoot family and the whole poem actually references the Dionysian myth. Because Adonis, who's slain by the boar, is associated with the Dionysian myth as practiced by the Greeks at Eleusis and Athens. Zagreus, who is also known as Bacchus, is born and then slain as a boar. He then resurrects and ascends as Dionysus the swan. So Zagreus, also known as Bacchus, is the boar. And the boar was used as an emblem for the Bacon family. It represents bacon. In fact, bacon is made from, from the boar, from the pig, which is, which is killed and then treated in certain ways until it becomes bacon. And in Italian, uh, bacon is, was written with, in a book that Francis Bacon had published in, it, in Italian. Uh, bacon was written as Bacco, B-A-C-O or B-A-C-C-O. And that is actually the Italian for Bacchus. So there's a very big analogy across here. Um, Dionysus, who symbolizes the swan, his name or his quality, he, he, he's known as the free. His name actually means the son of God, but his quality or his title, if you like, is the free, the one who gives freedom and the one who is free. And it's interesting, the name Francis actually means free. So in the whole Dionysian myth, you've got the whole idea of Francis Bacon wrapped up in it as if he is here incarnate on earth to act out that myth, which is which exactly what I think he did uh, to, to, to help, help humanity eventually go through its big, big initiation, which we're going through nowadays. Um, the title page, Venus and Adonis, shows, well, confirms this in many ways. Um, you can see on this picture, I show you how the actual title, Venus, Adonis, you know, the capital letters of that give you the VA, which gives you together the Solomon seal, which is becomes the blazing Christ star or star of David. It's also known as the pole star. Um, then the following year in 1594, Lucrece, the poem Lucrece was published, also known as The Rape of Lucrece. So there's the title page and the dedication page of that poem. Again, the dedication is signed as by William Shakespeare, and it's again dedicated to Henry Riothsley, the Earl of Southampton. But unlike the Venus and Adonis, this is a very heavy-hearted, sombre poem. The story basically is about the, the Tarquin, who is king of Rome, desires and rapes the virtuous Lucrece, as a result of which Lucrece commits suicide. <coughs> and then, of course, when her husband returns and her friends, it results as an act of revenge in the revolutionary overthrow of the Tarquins, and the establishment of the Roman Republic. So it's, it's a carefully chosen poem that um, means quite a lot. Overthrown, overthrowing kingship and establishing a form of democracy. Um, it's quite 
quite significant. So that's happened quite a few times in all our democratic countries. That's exactly what has happened. And the danger is of reverting back again to Tarquins, <laughs> or kings ruling us, or dictators. Um, so we had to be careful and, and guard what we've got. Um, especially relevant nowadays. Now Venus and Adonis and Lucrece are actually Gemini poems. They deliberately were published together and because they're showing again the double truth. Here are the two title pages again of them. So Venus and Adonis, you got it as a light-hearted erotic poem, which is like a comedy, you know, the Shakespeare comedy. It's a mystery play, all comedies are mystery plays, where death leads to resurrection and immortality. And then you've got, in contrast to that, The Rape of Lucrece, which is a heavy hearted, sombre poem. It's a tragedy. There's a violent rape by a tyrant leading to the death of an innocent, followed by revolution with a form of democracy replacing tyrannical rulership by kings. So two very different stories, twins to each other. One involved with immortality and, and the other one very, very mortal and so on, the immortal and the mortal. But both of them have hope in them. Hope for something better is given in both poems, essentially because of love, love that is shown. Hope, hope. So the huge emblem in the middle of the title pages of each poem shows you the anchor of hope. And that's what the Latin says around the anchor. Ancora spei, anchor of hope. In fact, the anchor is more than this. As a cross, it represents faith. As an anchor, it represents hope. And then there's a growth of acacia coming up it, in a, like a figure of eight. And this is, this is representing the charity. And the whole thing is held by the hand of God, and God is love. So it's representing something quite special. In fact, it represents all of the three great degrees of initiation by which we reach illumination and it, by, by which our mortal selves can become immortal. And if you look at the two, two acacias, they're like, they're in place of the, of the snakes. Usually you have snakes climbing up the, the cross. It's a tau cross. Usually you have snakes climbing up or a snake, single snake. But these two snakes are representing the, what, what in the Hindu tradition is called the Ida and Pingala channels of the spine, the two side channels. And then the central channel is called the Kundalini, the flow of energy that comes through the body and, 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 and nourishes and enlightens each chakra. And um, in Freemasonry and, and in terms of Solomon's temple, they're the right hand and left hand pillars and they represent the immortal and the mortal, the Gemini. And when they marry in love, they become the single pillar, the middle pillar, um, known as the pillar of beauty. And then an additional thing, the, the two snakes of acacia are shown like a figure of eight. And the figure of eight is a symbol of Mercury. And Mercury is known as the immortal mortal or the mortal immortal. Mercury is both mortal and, and immortal. He's, he's double, he's also a hermaphrodite, male and female. So Mercury embodies, embodies everything. Now, if you count the pearls around the edge of the picture of the anchor, which I did, believe it or not, actually 88 pearls in the oval frame. If you write that as a cipher, eight, eight <coughs> gives you the twin Mercury, the double eight, um, two Mercuries, the Gemini again, the idea of the Gemini again. Very, very, very clever. So the main focus, the main thing that's being given out is, is about the truth, the double truth, right from the start, given out. This, this is the truth. It's a double truth. How are we going to deal with it? How are we going to learn to love each other enough so we, we bring the two truths together 
and achieve the mystical marriage. Now on the title pages of these poems, you can see a headpiece. Now these are Gemini headpieces. I'll show you a bit a colored so you can see it a bit better. Um, so the Gemini are the winged pan-like figures on each side of the central face of what's called the bride. So you can see one there with wings, a winged pan-like figure, and there's another winged pan-like figure. Now this represents the Gemini as spirits, pure spirits, the heavenly twins, literally. And the peacocks down below, but each side of the face um, represent immortality, their symbol of immortality. And the face here with the veil dropped down and the crown on top of her, it's, she's called bride, which means truth revealed. Truth is now revealed. And that's revealed by the soul, always symbolized as being feminine, um, as opposed to the spirit, which is symbolized as being masculine. The, the soul is able to manifest the spirit of truth hidden in the heart through her face. And that's called the countenance of the Lord. She's shining the countenance of the Lord, which is the truth. She is revealing the truth because she knows the truth. She is illumined by the truth. Um, this is truth revealed, the full meaning, the full symbol of, of what, what, what knowledge means, full knowledge. Um, and she's called the bride of the spirit, the bride of the Lord, truth revealed. Now these Gemini headpieces sign all three of the main Shakespeare works, the poems, sonnets and plays. And they rep they're all slightly different and they represent the three worlds of existence, what are known as the spiritual, celestial and natural worlds, or simply spirit, soul and body. We're, we're all supposed to be a trinity of spirit, soul and body, the three, three great worlds. So at the top, you've got the um, headpiece um, on the poems, where the Gemini are spirits. Then on the sonnets, you've got the Gemini, it's definite human beings, but they're winged. So they're, they're the celestial world. They're, they're immortal mortals, whereas the spirits are pure immortals. The soul realm is the realm of the mortal immortal where the mortal soul has become immortal and fused with the high, higher self. And interestingly, you've got low, beneath each of the twins, you've got a rabbit, which in those days, or a, or a hare rather, in those days were called conies, and they're put back to back to each other. And this forms a rebus, meaning back only. So just Bacon brothers couldn't resist putting their signature in back only, just, just to make it clear there. They're the divine, they're the heavenly twins. And then on the plays, when the plays came out in, in 1626, the AA symbol there is two very mortal twin souls, two twin boys lying on their A's, each lying on their own A, and holding a ribbon that ties together a, a sheaf of wheat or barley. It's again, it's a, sim it's a symbol of the lesser mysteries of initiation, which we all have to go through. To, and then we go through our, our, um, our death, initiatory death uh, with the harvesting. And then we're, we're resurrected from that and so on like, like that. So it's, it's symbolizing what the mortal has to go through in order to become immortal. So it's, it's quite remarkable, isn't it, uh, how these, this was all carefully designed, obviously right from the start, was how this was going to be done. And then hidden away, the, another Rosicrucian signature is carefully put into the sonnets to, to announce, you know, this is, this is a Rosicrucian um, work that's being given to the world. So if you put the dedication pages of the two poems together. You see the letter that's the big letter in, bo in a box that introduces the dedication. One is an R on Venus and Adonis, but on Lucrece it's a T. 
RT. RT, signifying Greek, the rho, which is in, in Greek letter, it looks like a P, um, but it's called a rho. And then the cross here is a tau cross rather than the rather than the, the chi cross. The chi cross is the um, like a St. Andrew's cross, but the tau cross is the upright cross. Uh, but it gives the same signature that, like a chi rho, which is the rose cross. It's the meaning of the rose cross. Um, the Christ, the Christ is the true rose cross being, rosicrucian being. You become a Christ as soul when you become a rose rosicrucian. Because you marry the two together. The cross represents the, the, the light of truth, the spiritual light of truth. And the rose is the human soul grown to its full beauty and it becomes one with that cross because it reaches beauty because it embodies, manifests the meaning of the cross, which is love. In, sac, sac, and love is sacrificial because the labor of love, you have to give yourself all the time. So it's considered a cross a sacrifice and through the initiations and um, the two become one fused together that the rose cross. So there is a very subtle signature of the Rosicrucians on those two dedication pages. And then the, the main ancient signature, the double A signature, heads the dedication page of Venus and Adonis. And just a reminder to the AA represents Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Um, in Hebrew, it's Aleph Tau. In, in um, Greek, it's Aleph, Alpha Omega. Represents the spirit and the bride, the spirit and the soul, the truth and the truth revealed. Bacon described it as the truth of being and the truth of knowing. And they're one, they become one, they are one. And, and also in, in um, Kabbalah, they're described as wisdom and knowledge. And these AA headpieces, variations of them, sign all three of the main Shakespeare works, the poems, sonnets, and plays. So the poems have the Venus and Adonis, AA like that, where the A's are joined very, very tightly together. Then you've got the sonnets, the AA has a has 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 a, a sort of urn, but it's a grail cup filled with good things um, in the midst of it and with birds on each side. And then the AA for the Shakespeare plays is the one with the Gemini on it and the and the sheaf of wheat in the middle and the face of Pan down down below. Now the authorship of Venus and Adonis and Lucrece was you know, hidden behind the pseudonym of William Shakespeare. But in an exchange of satires published during 1597 to eight, the authorship of these poems was attributed to Francis Bacon by the poet writers, John Marston and Joseph Hall. And they identified Francis Bacon under the name of Labio, who was a famous Roman jurist who fell afoul of the emperor together with the Bacon motto, mediocria firma, which means the middle path is strong or firm, reliable. And they associate this labio with the cynic and the cynic's helmet. Now the cynic refers to Diogenes of Sinope, who is one of the founders of cynic philosophy, who is also known as Diogenes the cynic. And the appellation of cynic was given to a member of the school of cynic philosophy who believed virtue to be the only good and self-control to be the only means of achieving virtue. The cynic's helmet that was also mentioned in their satires alludes to an entertainment called the Honorable Order of the Knights of the Helmet enacted during the 1594 Gray's Inn Christmas Revels. And 1594, before, before Christmas came of course, Francis Bacon, was unusually made a co-treasurer of Gray's Inn. Normally there's only one treasurer who's the head of the inn, 
but that year they made Francis Bacon an extra treasurer, co-treasurer of Gray's Inn. And he was elected as co-treasurer in order to restore the inn's reputation in regard of the Christmas revels. So they knew he was the only one who could do this. Uh, the, the, there had been this um, uh, sickness around, um, which stopped, stopped, closed all theatres and closed a lot of things down. So they could revels couldn't be put on again. You know, the plague called it the plague, a bit like what we got now, I guess, but even worse. And so the, the revels hadn't been put on for several years by Gray's Inn, and they wanted to recover their their reputation in respect of this because the inn was famous for the best revels of all the inns of court. So this meant that Francis Bacon was responsible for and in charge of the revels. And he was the one who, and therefore was the one who designed them, wrote them with the assistance of other members of Gray's Inn and directed them. And in the revels, he's referred to as the conjurer and the magician. And the Gray's Inn revels took place in December and January 1594 to five. Um, and they were called the High and Mighty Prince Henry Principal Pool and the Honorable Order of the Knights of the Helmet. And the revels take place, traditionally take place over 12 days of Christmas. And during these revels, three grand nights were planned. But unfortunately, only two were actually performed. And the third grand night had to be canceled for whatever reason. The first grand night was on the 28th of December, 1594, the Feast of the Holy Innocents. And this is when the Templars from the Inner Temple Inns of Court were invited as guests of honor, together with nobles and high ranking officers of the Queen's government. And this, they take place at night or in the evening and go through the night. And they're designed and referred to later as the Night of Errors because things went wrong. Deliberately, it's all, all designed, you can see that. And during this time, a play was acted called The Comedy of Errors, which is said to be the Shakespeare play, the first appearance of the Shakespeare play, The Comedy of Errors. And it's all about chaos. And in it are the twins, times two, two sets of twins. Each twin is a master and a servant. And this is the, this is the story of the whole Lager and the Swan story. There are there's, there's an immortal son and an immortal son and an immortal daughter and a mortal daughter. So every brother has a sister. And, um, but in this, the, the twins are made all male, probably because Gray's Inn was for male, men only and uh, women were not allowed there. And um, so it's an in, this is an interesting thing that goes on with the Shakespeare plays. So it's a story of two sets of identical twins who were accidentally separated soon after birth. And um, you probably all know the story, so I won't, won't go through it. But at the end, there's a coming to, coming to, there's chaos time and the switch, you know, the mistaken identities, wrongful beatings, near seduction, the arrest of one of the twins, and false accusations of infid infidelity, theft, madness, and demonic possession. And the story culminates in the Abbey of Ephesus, wherein the abbess reveals she is the mother of the Antiphilus twins and wife of Aegean, their father. And the Duke pardons Aegean, who had actually come to Ephesus in search of his wife and family, but been imprisoned. And then the whole family is, is reunited. So it ends up with a reunion at the end um, in the Abbey of Ephesus, which is interesting because Ephesus was, it's certainly in the Christian tradition, is known as the, the great home and place where John the Beloved dies. And the higher mysteries, like in Freemasonry, the higher mysteries, which is associated with the Rosicrucian mysteries, are dedicated to John the Beloved, whereas the lesser mysteries, the craft, craft degrees, are dedicated to John the Baptist. So this, this is an important point. And the Abbey of Ephesus is also a Christianized version of the temp great temple of Ephesus. So it's really referring to the cathedral that was later built at Ephesus. Um, so on the second grand night took place the on the 3rd of January, 1595, the feast of the most holy name of Jesus. 
Again, nobles and high-ranking officers of the Queen's government were invited as guests of honour. And during this, a, a great mask was presented called the Honourable Order of the Knights of the Helmet. Their purpose was to restore order out of chaos. And the helmet refers to Pallas Athena's helmet. Pallas Athena is the spear shaker. That's, that's the meaning of her name and why she has this famous spear. But the goddess is also famous for rewarding her knight heroes with golden helmets of illumination for protection and invisibility. It's interesting, the Rosicrucians were referred to as the invisibles who made up the invisible college. They were the invisible ones. And the name William is derived from the Old Norse, gilden, which means golden, and helm, which means helmet. And in Old German, it's derived from will, which means desire or will, and helm, which means strength and protection. And Pallas Athena's knights literally were spear shakers, just like the Gemini. Then the third grand knight was postponed, but it's from what one, you know, researching that one can find out that it was planned to put love, the play Love's Labour's Lost on, on that third night. And there are references to it in the, in the whole of the Grey's Inn, Revels, Entertainments, um, references to which then carried on in Love's Labour's Lost. Now Love's Labour's Lost, this is why I'm, I am amused by what the Bacon brothers are doing. It's a satire on an all male society, which the Grey's Inn, which needs women, actually needs women in order to discover truth. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely pointless being in an all male society because <laughs> you'll never discover the real truth, which is love. And at the end of the story, it's about love's labor, the labor of love. Um, it's work of charity. Um, and love's labor is, is, as Bacon describes it, the work that God works from beginning to end, which is love in action. And this, this is called, biblically called the word, the word of God. And this is the truth, the light that shines everywhere. So love's labor is the lost word of Freemasonry, which Freemasonry seek, which basically is charity, love in action. Now in 15, October 1595, Anthony Bacon moved into Essex House. And um, so he was absolutely on the spot all the time both for intelligence work, but also for the meetings of the poets and so on. And in 1595, uh, John Dee was appointed warden of Christ College, Manchester, and he moves to Manchester. Now that's an important place in respect of London, which I'll show you another time, because it's, it has to do with what I've discovered to be the, what's called the landscape zodiac of Britain. It's now England and Wales, but it's then known as Britain and um, set up originally by the Celts, but used by successive cultures ever since. And the Tudors knew it, the Rosicrucians knew it, and they used it. So it's, it's very significant John Dee was moved up there at that time. It's a balance to London. That, that's the best way to say it, to balance things out. And we need that nowadays. You know, too much has gone into London, to Westminster. It needs a balance. We need the balance, and Manchester is already being promoted as the possible balance to London, so that good things are afoot. In 1596, a very important publication came out called Of Prayer and Meditation by Louis de Granada. And on it, on the title page, you get this emblem of time brings forth the hidden truth. Now the, the publication is a book of prayers and meditations for the days and weeks of the year. And it was very, very popular at that time. And really it's helping you to attune to every day and every week of the year and what it means, its significance of what it means because time brings forth the truth. So you make your prayers, but you do your meditations too. And then you learn from that and hopefully bring that into practice in your life. Um, time is the hierophant of the mysteries. Time is known in esoteric tradition as the hierophant of the mysteries. Time is the alpha. 
time is the time is time is the alpha, the original truth, and truth revealed is the omega um, that that time brings forth. It represents spirit and soul, wisdom and knowledge. So here you see time, the alpha, bringing forth the revealed truth with her crown and her face revealed, um, bringing her forth from the darkness of a cave. Sometimes it's a deep well that she's brought forth from or, or brought rescued out of the clutches of what's called, um, um, not, not pride, um, well, it represents all the vices, the cl clutch of all the vices. She's freed from from the vices that hold her back otherwise. So the same emblem is used later in Francis Bacon's New Atlantis that was published shortly after he died in 1627. But it was previously used on the New Testament of the Geneva Bible published in 1557. So it's not new, it's, a, it's an older emblem, but published by the, the groups of pe this group of people, several groups of people, all seeking the truth and all knowing a lot of esoteric things and, um, and trying to promote it. And in 1598, Francis Bacon published his essays, his first book of essays. Actually, it's three books in one. His, his essays, religious meditations and places of persuasion and dissuasion. Places of persuasion and dissuasion are later on called the colours of good and evil. Three different things. And it's, they're dedicated, the book is dedicated to Anthony Bacon, to Anthony Bacon, his dear brother, loving and beloved brother. So it's, it's showing there is a real love between those two brothers and it's, they were acting out, they, they were like the embodiment of the Gemini myth. and. Um, Francis Bacon, because his birth was really rather special, um, born of the Queen, really, um, not, not the son of Sir Nicholas Bacon and Lady Anne Bacon, but adopted by them. Whereas Anthony Bacon was the son of commoners, um, the, you know, Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne, but Francis Bacon was the immortal, if you, from that point of view, in terms of being born of the Virgin Queen, the Celestial Queen. So they knew this, they, they, were, they felt they were on earth, obviously thought they were on earth to act, act all this out. And, um, and that's how Francis Bacon got his great vision, realizing what he could do and how to do it. Um, and the interesting thing about, about this book, I've got a copy, somebody gifted me a copy many, many years ago, and it's very, very precious this one, but all the degrees of initiation are shown in the emblems in the book. First of all, right at the beginning of the book, you got this emblem of the wheat sheaf, which represents the lesser mysteries of initiation, the beginning of everything. That, that is the beginning of any, any form of growth in terms of initiation, of learning about the truth. You have to be a gardener, gardener of nature, a farmer, sowing and reaping. And you have to experience that in your own life. And, um, and then at the very end of the book, the, the, a page called Fini, meaning finish, you've got the two Gemini there, the pure heavenly twins playing music. But and, and between them, you've got the face of truth revealed, the face of the bride, truth revealed, fully crowned, and above her, a symbol of the grail. The Holy Grail raised up to become the crown of creation, which is the, the, the um, Hebrew story about the Grail. It's, it's Lucifer fallen down, who's then raised up to become the crown of creation, the Holy Grail, um, containing all truth, truth revealed. Um, so it's, it's, it's all, all shown in that. And of course, the musician, the, the Gemini is shown as musicians because they they can play heavenly music and they've achieved heaven by means of the arts and sciences. So there they, they sit in enjoyment and peace. Then in the, these set of three emblems on the other side of the picture I'm showing you, at the top, you've got the Gemini masking. There they are with masks, hiding behind masks, referring to masking. 
um, which, which are plays, similar plays, the masking's all done, it's play acting. But the psyche, psyche is the mask of our real soul. So, you know, it's masking our, our psyche, our outer self masks our real self, that, that's within. And, um, and this is what the plays are representing um, in life. And it also represents the, the lesser mysteries which to do with the psyche and training the psyche in the right way, like actors are trained. Then the, the next symbol, next emblem down, shows the two twins drinking wine, each side of Bacchus, um, the symbol of Bacchus here. So they're in the Bacchanalia. And this is a symbol of the greater mysteries, of the love, what's called the love feast, the agape feast of the great, greater mysteries, the Bacchanalia, which the Romans distorted and perverted and made into a gross thing. And that's what most people think of the Bacchanalia. But the original Bacchanalia was a very, very sacred feast, just like Jesus did with his disciples at the Last Supper. That was a bacchanalia, um, a, very, a holy feast, a love feast. Um, and then the last emblem down below, the Gemini riders, they're riding their white horses with truth revealed in between them, the face of truth, truth revealed. Gemini riders on white horses, truth revealed. It's, it's referencing the book, book of Revelation, sometimes called the Apocalypse, where the last rider appears on the white horse and he's called faithful and true. They got the whole, whole thing in this book of essays. Fantastic. And that brings you to the end of the century. And at the end of the century, a great change occurs. So that's the end of my talk at that point. And I'll go on to the next phase in my next talk. But I think it's a magical, Magical thing that was done, absolutely magical. I hope, hope, you, hope you think so too, and uh, can understand it a bit more. All the time that it's teach, teaching, teaches me all the time. Every time I look at it again, I learn something more. Okay, I'll stop there.